Speaker's house. I'd like to remind everyone we're practicing social distancing here. Praise God. Let's sing, I love your grace.
like our God. You know, during this time of this um, you know, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, you know, I, I wonder, you know, some of these people, they're not Christians. They have no hope apart from what they're hoping the government will give them and this and that. You know, I praise God that we have a hope that is a rock of our salvation. Praise God. Let's sing. Lord is here. Lord is here. few people still feel the spirit of God. It's saying a rock of fortress.
basic uh, truths of Christianity is, is we're a, a needy people. Uh, I was talking with Brother Rod, you know, when I was uh, young and strong and when I was a teenager, I really didn't realize the need, uh, the desperate need that I had in my own life because I was sufficient of myself. I was a God of my own life. Amen. But one of the factors of getting old is it just makes you realize how needy you are and thank God that God feels that great, great need in our life. And so we want to go before the Lord tonight with the needs in our own individual lives, families, friends, loved ones. We want to bring the needs of our nation, amen, before God. And so just with a rock-solid confidence, amen, that, that God hears, that God responds. And so I would like you tonight to just take your need and put it in that dotted line. I ask you to remember to pray for our president, that God would give him wisdom and guidance and direction. And uh, right now, amen, just very, very imperative for where we are as a nation. And so we want to pray for our nation, amen, that God would help us, that God would intervene, uh, that God would undertake. We want to pray for our soldiers that are in harm's way want to remember to pray for our pastors, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, Pastor Greg, the great responsibilities uh, that are uh, extenuated now as a result of this, and we want to pray for God's wisdom and favor for them. And so uh, let's lift up our needs. Uh, just encourage you uh, tonight, if I can, to just uh, exhort you to, to find ways to help, to find ways to meet needs. Uh, we never dreamed that we would be looking at what we're doing now. And so, but I want you to look for ways. Uh, my wife is so, she's so helpful. Her mind's always working. And she's telling me on the uh, way to church, we just got to find ways to meet needs. We've got to find ways to meet needs. And I really want to encourage you for our older saints, our older saints uh, that, uh, that are more vulnerable. And uh, maybe you could shop for them. And whatever you can do to meet needs, I uh, got a phone call from somebody asking if we could shop for them because they're older. And so please, I just really want to encourage you, you know, as we go before God in our prayers to, to find ways that you can reach out, to find ways that you can minister. And I truly believe that if that's your heart, God will show you ways. And so let's, let's believe God for all of these needs tonight. Pray for one another, amen, and uh, calling out to God. And then as we subside, I'd like to ask if my brother Rod, if you would please uh, open our service tonight in a word of prayer. Join with me. Let's pray and ask God to help us. God, thank you, Lord. We, we count on, we call on your strength, Lord. God, we lean on your strength, Lord. We run to the mountains of God. From whence cometh our help, Lord. God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, we're trusting every need, God. We relinquish into your hands tonight. Minister to us. Help us. Encourage all that watch this tonight, we pray.
is so great. God. You may be seated tonight. Amen. If I could ask you to separate even more than what you are now. Amen. And so please, we've got a lot of room in this area. And so thank you, Joel, if you would. Amen. Families can stay together. No problem. Amen. Tom, if you could separate, you're too close. Amen. And uh, it's got nothing to do with your breath or your cologne or it just we just want to please please abide by this amen and and uh, just get far away from everybody we love each other but we're right now we're loving each other at a distance is what we're doing and so praise god we want to welcome everyone out to our uh evening service tonight i i have a new all my life all my all my saved life i I've understood, I mean, it's like the 11th commandment, how important church is. And, but now that is, it's like with all that's going on in our world today, uh, this is being accentuated in my life. It's a facet now of how important it is that God is showing me now is how incredibly important coming to church is. And, and so I, I uh, thank you for your attendance. Our governor, just a couple of days ago, he clamped down. He applied uh, uh, originally what we had is we had a, he okayed crowds of 50 or under. And our governor, what he did is a couple of days ago, if you read it, he clamped down. But he, he put a clause on there, our governor did, that it's okay for churches. And so we're still... We're still, you know, we're not going to go over 50. I, I thought when he clamped down, I truly thought that what we're going to have to start doing is just maybe the song leader and, uh, and uh, the musicians. That's what I was prepared for. But still, we could continue to have church the way we are with our governor's blessing. And so, praise God for that. Amen. Uh, we just uh, want to remind you, amen, uh, that... Uh, that our services are available on YouTube, and that has turned out to be uh, just a secret blessing. Uh, I'm getting, uh, you, you don't get the phone calls, I do because I'm the pastor. I'm getting phone calls. I'm getting phone calls of people that I have forgotten about, but they're telling me, they, they say, Pastor, we're watching, we're in church, we're watching via YouTube. And so, and so, uh, seeds are being planted, amen. People that, 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 that honestly, that we don't know, that we have forgotten about, they're going on our website, it's so easy, they could go on, uh, uh, and, and also as well, I just want to encourage you, because on our website, what you could do is you can copy the link directly from YouTube and send the link to family and friends and boom, all they have to do is click on that link, and they can hear a sermon. And so uh, if any time, uh, you know, you hear a message that you think, that, wow, my, my aunt, my uncle, you know, uh, uh, a co-worker that they need to hear, all you have to do is copy the, the, um, the Earl, I guess is what it is, paste it, and send it. And, uh, and so it's a tremendous way of evangelism. It's a tremendous way of getting people saved. So I just really, really want to encourage you to, uh, to do that and to be a part of that. Praise God. Amen. If our ushers would come this evening and uh, we, uh, we encourage you, amen, to uh, continue to give and to support the kingdom of God. Amen, and, uh, and just to honor God. Tenth is the Lord's, and offerings are besides. And so tonight, if you would be a blessing, we above all people in America, I know what it is to be a blessed. I, I'm a blessed man. I gotta tell you, 
I truly feel like I'm one of the most blessed men you will ever see in your lifetime. I'm just, I, that's where I, I feel like David. I feel when David said, my cup runs over, that's the way I feel. <coughs> and I know that, that, that blessing, the blessing of God, it's triggered. It's triggered by, by, by how we respond in giving. And so I encourage you tonight, those of you that are blessed, give and be liberal. Amen. And, and, and if no other reason you give, give just to make the devil mad. Amen. That's good enough reason to give. Amen. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to ask if my brother Vincent would ask God's blessing on the, uh, on the offering. via YouTube just to encourage you as well, amen, that you would, uh, that you would give and tithe and, and be a support to your church, amen, uh, just because you can't physically come, uh, I'm trusting, I have no way of knowing, but I'm trusting that you are viewing our participating, you're viewing our services at home and uh, not only is, not only viewing, but but with your giving and your support to be a blessing. Hebrews chapter number 11. On day six of the ill-fated mission Apollo 13, the astronauts needed to make a critical course correction. If they failed, they might never return to Earth. To conserve power, they shut down the onboard computer that steered the craft. Yet the astronauts needed to conduct a 39-second burn of the main engines. So how were they to steer? Astronaut Jim Lovell determined that if they could keep a fixed point in space in view through their tiny window, they could steer the craft manually. And so that focal point of the earth through that little window turned out to be their destination. They focused on the planet earth. As shown in 1995's hit movie, Apollo 13, for 39 agonizing seconds, Lovell focused on keeping the earth in view in that little window. By not losing sight of that reference point when they had turned the computers off, by not losing sight of that visible, visible reference point, the three astronauts were able to avoid total disaster. The Bible again admonishes you and I to, again and again admonishes us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ whom the Bible calls the author and the finisher of our faith. These astronauts, when they had to shut down the computers to do a, 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 to conserve energy, how, how they kept from just veering off, they, they just kept a fixed reference point of the planet through their, 
little tiny window. And that's what we're to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the danger that we face, not only with all that's going on in our world today, but the danger that we face is that, is that when, when you lose focus, when you lose focus of your reference point, how many, do you know what it's like to drift? Do you know what it's like to, to drift not closer to God, but farther away from God? And ultimately, if you lose your focus, your reference point of the Lord in your life, ultimately, ultimately, your soul can be lost. Ultimately, you can lose your salvation. What I would like to do tonight uh, I'd like to talk to you about fear. Because fear is something, it's an emotion like, like a, a number of other deadly emotions. There are emotions in life that can cause you to lose track of God, to lose focus. And, and fear is one. And fear has horrible, debilitating uh, consequences. And so I want to talk to you tonight. The title of my sermon is No Fear Faith. And it's out of one scripture, Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 27. Praise God if you have that tonight. Hebrews 11 and verse 27. The Bible says these words. Why don't you stand to your feet tonight? Stand to your feet. Let's just all read it together. One verse of scripture. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Let's read it together. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Father, we come before you tonight. We ask you to bless your word. God, encourage, minister to fearful hearts. Bring deliverance and victory, we pray. Thanking you for this, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. You could be seated. I want to talk to you, first of all, about the empty life. The empty life. This is an easy scripture. This is uh, so short, you know, memory verse, you can memorize it. Read it two, three times through, and you can memorize it. The Bible says in our text that he forsook Egypt. And the he that this scripture is talking about is none other than God's man, Moses. Our scripture goes on to say, and this is what I want to highlight, not fearing, not fearing the anger of the king. Not fearing the anger of the king. And so this little tidbit of scripture tells us when Moses left Egypt. Now, what I want to bring to your attention is, is that Moses left Egypt twice. The first time he left because he killed the Egyptian. The Bible tells us roughly at about the age of 40, if you remember the scenario, he saw a Jew and Egyptian fighting and Moses rose up, you know, wanting to be the deliverer that God called him to be, thinking that this was God's timing. What Moses did is he killed the Egyptian that was, that was struggling with, with the Jew. And as a result of that, uh, Pharaoh was out to kill Moses because he had killed the Egyptian. And so this is what our text says that fearing Pharaoh, he left Egypt for the first time. He left Egypt out of fear. Are you with me tonight? And so we know that the, that the first time that he left Egypt is not what our text is talking about because our text tells us that when, Pharaoh, that when Moses left Egypt, he was not afraid. So this isn't the same time frame. The second time that Moses left Egypt, uh, roughly it happened when he was 80 years old. This was during the time when he literally was the deliverer, when he got God's people 
out of, out of Egypt. This is the, the great exodus that we read about in the book of Exodus. The second time that Moses left Egypt is, is, when, is when he left in the exodus and God told Moses, I want you to set my people free. So there were two times that Moses left Egypt, once about 40, and then the second time in 80, when he was about 80. And so once again, I just want to read uh, the, the main thought of our text that we just read. The Bible says, by faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And there's a reason why. This is what I want to highlight tonight. <clears throat> there's a reason why Moses was not afraid. And maybe tonight you ought to underline it. You ought to underline it in your Bible. You ought to underline the scripture we read because the Bible says that Moses, he wasn't afraid. The Bible said he endured the anger of Pharaoh because he saw him who is invisible. Amen. Did you hear what I just said tonight? This is why, this is why Moses, he, he, the first time he left, you remember, he, he left in fear for his life. He left because he thought Pharaoh was going to kill him for killing the Egyptian. But the second time he left, the Bible says he, he left without anger because he saw him, he left without fear, excuse me, because he saw him who was invisible. And what God had done is, are you with me? God had set him free from fear. This is very, very profound. You and I are living in some fearful times, uh, to say the least, in case you haven't noticed lately. I thought about calling this sermon tonight Fear Management in Fearful Times because, because I've learned if you don't manage fear, it will manage you. If you don't manage any deadly emotion, <coughs> if you don't manage lust, it will manage you. If you don't manage hatred, it will manage you. And so I thought about calling this fear management in fearful times. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we are living in, in fearful times. And one of the reasons that I, I'm really able to help manage my fear is because I don't have a TV. Can I tell you, if during these times, if you don't have a TV, that, that will help, that will drop your anxiety level massively by not having a TV because I mean and please I get my news I, I get my information but if you watch TV I mean it just non-stop you know what are we going to do and so what we have today in our generation is, is, is fear of infection fear of hospitalization fear of death fear for our loved ones fear for our families. Today we have a fear, you know, of not having enough. Am I going to have enough meat? Am I going to am I going to have enough toilet paper? There's there's the uncertainty of of jobs and layoffs and and people not working. And listen folks, today people are frightened. Listen to what I'm saying. People are very frightened. Because the number of fears that we deal with, folks, they're, they're every color in the book of, in, the, in, a, in a box of crayons. Our, our fears are myriad. But the one thing that I want to highlight, and I was so excited as I was putting this message together, is the one thing that I want to highlight is in the early years of Moses' life, this great man of God, he lived by fear. His life was marked by fear. But listen, something happened. Something happened to Moses because we read it. There was a time frame in his life. He ran from Pharaoh because of fear. But something happened to him and now we read he's not afraid anymore. He's not afraid anymore. 
If I could read it, it, the account in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that way and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and he thought, what I have done must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian, where he sat down by the well. And so we read of this time period in his life, the first 40 years of his life. The Bible says he was afraid. And then the second 40-year period of time frame in Moses' life, again, he was afraid. You can break Moses' life down to three segments. Three segments of 40 years. He was 40, he was 80, and then the last 40. And so the first 40 years of his life, he spent thinking, I'm somebody. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he's thinking, I'm next in line to be Pharaoh. I'm next to be Pharaoh. Uh, the first 40 years of Moses' life, you know the story. He had the riches of Egypt in his hand. At the ripe young age of 40, literally, he had life by the tail. But what he did is he ended up taking matters into his own hands. And the result of that is now he's running for his life in fear. Then comes the next 40 years. The next 40 years is he's living on the backside of the desert with his father-in-law. This is where he ran because he was afraid that Pharaoh was going to kill him. And so now, first 40 years, Moses thought he was a somebody. He was going to be a deliverer. He was going to take matters into his own hands. But now, the second 40 years of his life, he's on the backside of the wilderness. He's tending his father's sheep, a, mid, a shepherd out in the middle of nowhere. And now, now Moses is a, is a nobody. And then the final last 40 year segment period of his life, we discover how many of you know what God can do with a nobody? First, no, Moses thought, I'm a somebody. And then God showed him, I'm a nobody. And then the last 40 years of his life, God shows Moses what he can do with a nobody. And I have to say, those are the three segments of my life. My early days, I thought I was, I thought I was something. And then the consequences caught up to me. And I found out I'm really a nobody. And then the last 40 years of my life, God has shown me what God can do with a nobody. It's my experience tonight, God can't work with a somebody. You think you're all up there. God can't work with a somebody. And the reason he can't work with a somebody is because you're so full of yourself, there's no room for God. There's no room for anybody else. You know that one of the great truths of our fellowship, one of the great truths of discipleship and Christianity and, and the Lord Jesus Christ working in your life, listen to me, God does not use you for what you are. He uses you for what you can become. That's profound. He does not use us for what we are. God sees the possibilities of your life. 
God sees what you can do for Him. God sees what you can become for Him. And that is literally, that is literally the truth behind Moses' life. God did not use him when he thought he was a somebody. God didn't use him when he, when he thought he was worthless on the backside of the, of the desert. Before God used him, how many of you know what God first has to do is He's got to empty you of yourself. Basic Christianity. Moses' first 40 years that he spent in Egypt, filled with self-reliance, he was in the king's pal- in Pharaoh's palace, full of self-centeredness. I can do this. Total self-reliance. The first 40 years of his life, he does not lay a hold of God. Here's the Hebrew and the Egyptian fighting. And self-reliantly, he takes matters into his own hands. And what happens? What happened to Moses? The same thing happened to Moses will happen to us when we take matters into our own hands. Moses turned into a murderer. That's what happens when you take things into your own hands. But next, in the second 40 years, we see, we see a different Moses. In this, in this next 40 years, he's, he's on the backside of the wilderness. Now he's struggling with, with condemnation and missing God, and total failure. Are you seeing it? The second 40 years of his life, he went from top of the world, living in Pharaoh's palace, you know, uh, being the, the deliverer God wanted him to be, and the second 40 years, now he's, now he's on the backside of the wilderness, reduced to nothing. And then the final segment... The final 40 years of his life, this is where the change came. He had this experience with God, where? At the burning bush. And so at the burning bush, God says, okay, Moses, now you're ready. Now you're ready to do what I want. Now you're ready to be my deliverer. And one of the reasons we know that Moses is ready is because he says, God, I can't. I can't do this. And uh, God, I, I, I'm a nobody. I'm a, I'm a failure. If you remember in the first 40 years, Moses, Mo, Mo, Moses took matters into his own hands. But now, in the last segment of his life, when God says, I want you to be my deliverer, Moses said, God, I, I can't do this on my own. And then from that burning bush encounter... What he does is he has a, he has a powerful one-on-one encounter with God. And out of that encounter, in a moment of time, Moses is changed, he's delivered, and he spends the last 40 years of his life like a lion defying Pharaoh. Not, not hindered by fear. Not set back. Listen to me. You don't stand against the highest power in the land if you're defeated and you're timid and you're shy. Something happened to him. And what happened to him, our text says it. Our text said he caught a glimpse of him who is invisible. Have you done that? Have you caught a glimpse of God? What we're looking at in in Moses' life, we're looking at the consequences of sin. The first third of his life, he missed God. The second third, the second third period of his life, he missed God. You can see the consequences of his sin. It's it's self-centeredness, self-assurance, self-reliance, self-centered. He missed God because he's full of himself. The second period in his life, he's full of condemnation and shame and failure. God, I'm a nobody. You can't use me. All of these, listen folks, these are the consequences of his sin. But the last 40 years of his life, 
He's void. He's not full of himself. He's not this lowly worm that, that can't do anything. Now we see in the closing moments of his life, we see a man who's reliant on God, reliant on his purposes, reliant. Matter of fact, do you remember when Moses prayed that great prayer? He said, God, blot out my name so that Israel might be saved. In other words, he cared more about the people of God than himself. He cared more about the purposes of heaven than himself. And now we see a total reversal. No fear, no reliance on self because he caught a glimpse of the invisible one. Listen to me, folks. That's good preaching. That's good preaching. I want to talk to you finally tonight. I want to talk to you about sanctification. Now, sanctification is a big fancy word. This is a very Bible literate church. People in this church know what sanctification means. But I want to bring you a new definition. At, at its very heart, it is the definition of sanctification. And this, this word sanctification means you are free from yourself. You're free from yourself. You're free from self-will. You're free from a self-centered life. You're free from self-gratification. You're free from selfishness. Whenever we think of sanctification, we think that's us when we're doing spiritual things. That, that, that I'm being sanctified, you know, when I pray, when I witness when I read my Bible, when I go to church, when I outreach, when I worship, I'm being sanctified. Listen, that's not sanctification. These things definitely lead to sanctification, but it's not sanctification in itself. The purpose of sanctification, God setting you apart. God making you like you're being sanctified. It means every day you're becoming more and more like Jesus, right? Yes. The purpose of sanctification is to rid you of yourself so you can become like God. If you're so full of self, you have no room for anyone else. And the first step of sanctification is God has to rid you of you so he can make you like Jesus Christ. The purpose of sanctification is to get self out of the way. We've used the word self a lot tonight. Self-will, self-centered, self-reliance, selfishness, self-conduct. We could go on and on and on. But if God is going to make you, if you're going to become like Jesus, first, You've got to be removed from the picture. It's no coincidence that some of the fastest growing religions in the world today are self-religions. Buddhism is sweeping the world. Buddhism is based on self-reliance and self-centeredness. Buddhism has four great, four great truths, if I could read them to you. Number one, pain is universal. Number two, the cause of pain is desire. Number three, the cessation of pain is achieved by the cessation of desire. And number four, the way pain is eased is what Buddha called the middle way. Now, the middle way. Buddha believed that by putting his body to death, uh, this is what he believed in. He, he believed basically in penance. And he would put his body through all kinds of physical torment because he thought that this is the way to nirvana. And then he got a revelation. The re revelation he got is torturing my body is not the answer. How many of you know uh, you learned that very quickly? Torturing my body is not the answer. And so from there, he went to leaning towards luxury and living a luxurious life. And then he came to the conclusion, torture is not the answer and luxury is not the answer. 
And so he created what he called the middle ground. He said the way to live is to get rid of all of your desires, to get rid of all of your needs. Here is one of the most famous quotes from Buddha. Uh, Be ye lamps unto yourself. Be a refuge to yourself. Do not look for anything from anyone other than yourself. Now, that is the essence of Buddhism. The essence of Buddhism is negate your desires. Don't don't depend on anyone but yourself. And that's that's how you achieve nirvana. That's how you achieve joy and peace. The essence of Buddhism is, a, is don't trust in anybody, anybody but yourself. Self-reliance. Then there's Hinduism, which is also built on self. Hinduism teaches the material world is just an illusion. And so by withdrawing from the material world, you move into the world soul. And the way you're absorbed into the world soul is what they call reincarnation. And what reincarnation teaches is that if you're good enough, that, that you keep coming back with, with, with better karma and better karma. And if you keep coming back with good lives and keep coming back with better karma, you, you, you come back higher levels until finally you ascend into what they call the world's soul. But the whole thing is built on you. The whole thing is built on self and your deeds and the good things that you do. Now let me give you the definition of sanctification because it's not built on self. Buddhism is built on self. Hinduism built on self. Christianity is not built on self. Let me give you the definition of sanctification. This is from, uh, this is from um, which Bible? It's uh, Unger's Bible. I don't remember which one it is. It's uh, sanctification is the process of God's grace by which the believer is separated from sin and becomes dedicated to God's righteousness. This is accomplished by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Sanctification results in holiness or purification from the guilt and power of sin. Sanctification as separation from the world and setting apart for God's service is a concept found throughout the Bible, spoken of as holy or as set apart in the Old Testament. There it is. That's from the Nelson's Bible Dictionary. That is the definition of this word sanctification. And what sanctification is, it's God getting you as far as he possibly can away from you so he can fill you up with him. That's what sanctification is. It's it's you being set aside for the purposes of God. And for you to do that, you have to, do you understand? You've got to pull the plug on yourself. That's why some of you struggle. You will not pull the plug on self. Your greatest enemy is self. But before God can fill you with, with who he is, he's got to get you away from who you are. Now let's tie this in with fear. Because fear ties into sanctification. It ties into self. The Bible is full of people who miss God because of fear. I heard the preacher say a moment ago that we are are extremely fearful today. We are very, very frightened today. And how many people in the Bible miss God because of fear? Abraham, he moved to Egypt because of a drought. He took with him his wife, Sarah. And look what fear will make you do. Fear made, Abraham said, I want you to lie. I want you to lie. 
Abraham said, I'm afraid that, that when we get down to Egypt, the king is going to kill me because you're so beautiful. He's going to want you. And so what I want you to do is I want you to tell the king that you're not my wife, you're my sister. And so what fear will do, fear will make you lie. Do you know that that is one of the primary reasons why people lie? It's because of fear. Did you know that? Fear caused Abraham to ignore God. Fear caused Abraham to step out in his own self-reliance, to depend on his own abilities, to lie, to endanger his wife. Fear caused him to endanger. How many of you know when you got married, you said, "What I want, I'm going to be a covering for my wife." Anybody of you ever say that? But was Abraham a covering for his wife? Was Abraham protecting his wife? No, he wasn't, because because fear causes you to lose reference points. Then there's Aaron. And the golden calf. You know the story. Moses up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. Moses has gone too long. The people start saying, Moses is, is, is dead. We want you to make us a God. How many of you know it's amazing how quickly people can backslide? In one day, in one day they're saying, Moses is gone. Make us a God. And so what Aaron does is he makes him a golden candle, a golden calf. Moses comes down from the mountain. He tells Aaron, Aaron, what have you done? And then Aaron said, he said, because I was afraid of the people. Aaron said, these people, they, they made me do it. I was afraid of what they would do to me. And Aaron's fear caused him to create this golden calf, which brought about the judgment of God. And I want to tell you, again, you might not see it. You might not, you might not connect the pieces together. But fear will always cause you to miss God. Fear will always cause you to believe in self. Your own thinking. Your own thought process. And this is what fear does. is You can't believe. You can't trust God. Then the third story. There's Peter. Jesus told the disciples, tonight one of you is going to betray me. You remember what Peter says, not me. It's going to be one of these guys. Everyone else might leave you, but, but not me. How's that for a picture of self-reliance? And then you remember that night as he's warming his hands by the fire. Jesus is being tried. He's being, he's being whipped. He's being spit upon. Because all Peter could think about is, is himself. And so tonight I've just read you a pretty impressive list of names. Moses, Abraham, Aaron, Peter. All of these great men of God. And the common denominator with all of them is fear caused them to miss God. Fear caused them to turn their back on God, and to depend upon themselves. That's what fear does. Do you understand? Fear, cause, fear ultimately it causes you to push God out of the driver's seat, and then Mr. Magoo takes over. This is what fear does. And the reason that I'm preaching on this is because fear says, God, you can't help me. Fear says, I have to do something. I have to take control. I have to act. And fear will always cause you to step out and miss God. The first 80 years of his life, Moses is struggling with himself and he's missing God. The last 40 years, he is finally free from fear. He goes before Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. He's facing down Pharaoh because the last 40 years of his life, he's seen him who is invisible and no more fear. Back to our text. I want to close with this. Faith. Faith. 
The Bible says Moses by faith left Egypt not fearing the king because he saw him who was invisible. I was, uh, before I got saved, right before I got saved, we were, I was with a bunch of friends and we were, we were partying at the dorms in NAU. And so I was walking through this hall and, and we, were, we, were really, we were really loaded. I'm walking down this hall and a couple of guys, what they did is they came out and as I'm, as I'm walking towards them, they, they, they start lipping me. They start getting really loud and this was going to be a really bad situation. This was just a bunch of guys and me by myself. And so I wasn't saying nothing and, and back behind these guys, that's where our room was, and back behind them, a friend of mine by the name of Jimmy Baker, he heard what was going on in the hall. And he pops his head out and he sees that these guys are coming at me and these guys, what they want to do, they want to hurt me. Jimmy Baker was huge. Jimmy Baker was massive. He was the biggest in, in, in globe. There was, there was nobody, there was nobody as chiseled as Jimmy Baker. He stepped out of the hallway. He's back behind these guys. He, he doesn't have a shirt on. And I mean, he's, he's just ripped. And he's walking towards these guys. Can I tell you, a new strength came over me. <laughs> and, 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 and we backed him down. Well, actually, it wasn't we. <laughs> but I'm closing tonight. We know that God will back us up. We know it. We know it in our mind. But see, that's where we miss God, you know, 14 inches. We know it in our mind, but see, our problem is, is trust. Will you trust God? We know he can. We know he can back us up. We, uh, we understand the omnipotence of God, all-powerful, but here's the rub. God, will you do it for me? Will you help me? Will you support me? We're so convinced he'll do it for others. But what about me? God, will you do it for me? And for those of you, I just want to read you the two words, the two first words of our text. It says, by faith. By faith. By faith, Moses left Egypt. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That great chapter, the heroes of the faith, it reads like this. By faith, Moses by faith, Isaac, by faith, Joseph, by faith, Jacob. And maybe tonight, in these perilous times that we're living in, maybe you ought to sign your name on the dotted line. Maybe you ought to sign it by faith, Joshua, by faith, CJ, by faith, Roxanne. Maybe you ought to own up to it and say, God, God, all the craziness is happening in our day and age. Moses lived a life marked by fear. But the last segment of his life, the reason he's able to do what he did is the Bible says he caught a glimpse of God and this is why he could face down Pharaoh. By faith. You have to believe God. And, and, and can I tell you, with all that's going on today in our world today, that is my only strength that I have. That's the only strength. That's why I get up. I can live in victory. I can live in joy. I don't live in fear. By faith. His name is Jonathan Swift. And he made this profound statement. He said, vision is the art of seeing things that are invisible. That's what faith does. Faith causes you to see the invisible. 
by faith, Moses saw, he, he saw the invisible God, and because of that, no more fear. Are you with me tonight? In May of 1995, Randy Reed, a 34-year-old construction worker, was welding on top of a nearly completed water tower outside of Chicago. According to writer Melissa Ramsdale, Reed unhooked his safety gear to reach for some pipes when a metal cage slipped and bumped the scaffolding he stood on. The scaffolding tipped and Reed lost his balance. He fell 110 feet, landing face down on a pile of dirt, just missing by inches rocks and construction debris. A fellow worker called 911. When the paramedics arrived, they found Reed conscious, moving, and complaining about a sore back. <laughs> Apparently, the fall didn't cost Reed his sense of humor because as paramedics carried him on a backboard to the ambulance, Reed had one request, please don't drop me. <laughs> Doctors later said Reed came away from the accident with just a bruised lung. And then this article ends with these words, sometimes we resemble that construction worker. God protects us from harm in a 110 foot fall but we're still nervous about three-foot heights. How many of you tonight, how many of you believe that the God who has saved you from, from death, hell, and the grave, how many believe that he can protect you from what's going on in our world today? I believe that. Maybe the problem isn't trust. For some of you, it's trusting God. Oh, he'll do it for everyone else, but he won't do it for me. For some of you, it might be a heart issue. It might be a heart problem. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And John is writing to you and I 2,000 years ago. And John says, You want to know why you're afraid? Why, why you're afraid? You want to know why your, your walk with God isn't getting deeper, it's not getting stronger, your love for Jesus is not getting stronger? You know why Moses could face Pharaoh down? The reason Moses could tell him, let my people go? Because he learned the revelation that perfect love casts out fear. And when you will get a glimpse of the invisible one, when you get a glimpse of God, can I tell you, that's the answer for fear today. Listen to these verses in Exodus 33 and Numbers 12 as I close. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Numbers 12 verse 7 says, My servant Moses is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth. And it was out of that relationship, these men, they... They, they had a, relay, a closeness with God that God speaks to them as a friend, mouth to mouth. And because of that loving relationship, the fear was gone. And that's what Moses discovered. That's why the last 40 years of his life, he could live fear-free because he caught a glimpse of the invisible God. Our heads are bowed. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. What a great truth. What a timely truth for the day and age that we're living in, a fearful generation. The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear, that when you can get a glimpse of God, that when you see him, when you know him for what he is, that your fear, you've got a confidence that God will never drop you, that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. Our world has radically changed in a short period of time. But I'm telling you, my faith has not changed. My faith, if it's not stronger today, it, it's as strong as it was one month ago. And because I have this strength, because I have seen this invisible God, 
I know what it is to touch him, to serve him, to be in relationship with him. And because of that loving relationship, listen, God's perfect love casts out fear. You don't have to live in fear, folks. I thought this was an incredible revelation, reading about this man. Missing God, Moses missing God because of a, a total reliance on self and, and his abilities. And what God had to do is before God can use him, God had to drain him first. Drain him of his self-sufficiency, his self-ability, his self-will. And you mark it down before you could be filled with God. You have to be drained of yourself. Jesus is Lord. And our prayer tonight is that, is, is that you would catch a glimpse this is what changed Moses, that that burning bush caught a glimpse of the living God. And because of that, the last 40 years of his life, as he's standing as a lion facing down the highest power in the world, no fear, because he had caught a glimpse of God. Is there anyone here tonight, you're not born again, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not right with God, and tonight, it's our prayer that you would come to your senses. I pray all the time, God, open their eyes. God, soften their heart. And tonight, that God would do that to you. That God would open your eyes and soften your heart. Maybe with all that's going on in the world today, maybe this fear is starting to get a hold of you and starting to grip you. And, and fear, again, calls you to miss God. And the answer for fear is a, is a faith and a confidence that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Anyone here tonight, you're not saved, you're not right with God, but you want to ask Christ to forgive you of your sin, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. All over this building, anyone, anyone. Not right with God, but you want to acknowledge tonight you want to acknowledge your sin. You want to turn from your sin. God, be merciful to me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Help me. Come into my life. Change me. Help me to be what you want me to be. Anyone, you want to respond, would you raise your hand? Let's stand to our feet tonight. Our altars are open. You can have it tonight. You can have it. A no fear faith. A no fear faith. I'm not talking about, you know, we're, we're concerned, obviously, concerned with what's going on in our world today, but with not to be ruled by fear, not to be controlled by fear. And tonight, you can have it. God will give it to you. A no fear faith tonight. Let's stand to our feet. Surround our church, our loved ones, protect us, I
God tonight. Let's give God praise. Let's begin to thank God for his power of work in our life. His ability to save, heal, and deliver tonight. Oh, God, we give you praise. Lord, we worship and honor you, oh, God. We thank you, God, for the hope that you bring to us, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I want to pray for you tonight. If everybody would, just for a moment, if you would stand to your feet and just right where you are. We're living in, in incredibly unsettled times. Uh, I know the majority of the people that we uh, serve God with, we go to church with, we've got a great confidence in God. We, 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 our, our faith is being tested, but at the end of the day, we have, by faith, we believe in God. But there are those that, that, that fear has struck their heart. They, they, they see, they read, they hear, they're, they're bombarded with information. Panic is gripping their family. Panic is, is, is this is the world that we're living in. And, and, and this is what I want to pray against. And before we pray, I just, just one little brief, brief, brief story. You remember the story is the disciples, they're in the boat. They're caught in the midst of the storm. The boat is about to go down. The, the, these men are about to drown. And all of a sudden, one of the men looks up, and what he does is he sees Jesus, and Jesus is, is walking on the water towards them. And immediately, at that point of time, here's these men. I mean, they're convinced it's over. They, they, they're convinced that, that they're all going to die. And But just one glimpse of Jesus... They saw Jesus coming. This is where Peter gets out of the water and out of the boat and he walks on water. And, and, and can you imagine the peace that must have come into their heart when they saw Jesus coming to them? Listen, folks, this is the kind of peace that I'm talking about. It's not a false hope. It's not an empty hope. No matter what goes on around us, we've got a confidence. We have a faith in God. And as a result of that, a peace that comes, no matter what you're going through or what you're experiencing, whether it's, whether it's work, whether it's hospitalization, whatever it might be, fear, infection. And what you can do is once you see Jesus, you get a, this is what happened to Moses. The reason he's unfettered and he's able to live in victory the last uh, closing years of his life is because he got a glimpse of the Holy One. I want you to lift your hands and I want you to say this prayer. I want you to repeat it after me. Dear Lord Jesus, God, tonight, I thank you for my salvation. Mine is truly an amazing salvation. I'm grateful for the work of God that you're doing in my life. God, I have seen you. I know your power and I know that you're able not only to do it for them, but to do it for me. And God, tonight, I choose to believe. I choose to trust. I choose to put my faith in you. God, that you will uphold me. That you will cover me. And right now, I bind every spirit of fear, every spirit of anxiety, I curse it. God, I'm asking you for your strength and your support in my life. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's begin to give God praise. Amen. Our heads are bowed. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You can have a no-fear faith. That's, this is what God calls us to. It's a no-fear faith. Things happen before we got saved, freak out, paranoia. Who knows what we did? But tonight, because of our trust and confidence of Him, no-fear faith. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.